Greetings, science fiction and fantasy enthusiasts. Do you read books? Do you watch films? Do you hate deodorant? Then welcome to our podcast. You're listening to No Deodorant in Outer Space with Ryan Sean O'Reilly. Now, let's get started. Do you suppose, Joe Frederson went on, that I need my secretary's pencils to check American stock exchange reports? The index tables of Rutwing's transocean trumpets are a hundred times more reliable and swift than clerks' brains and hands. But by the accuracy of the machine, I can measure the accuracy of the men. By the breath of machine, the lungs of the men who compete with her. And the man you just dismissed, and who is doomed for it to be dismissed by you, father, means going down, down, down. He lost his breath, didn't he? Yes. Because he was a man and not a machine. Because he denied his humanity before the machine. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, and welcome to another scintillating edition of No Deodorant in Outer Space. My name is Ryan Sean O'Reilly, and I'm broadcasting to you here from the twilight of Chicagoland, here in the edges of civilization. I'm uh, outside here, sitting next to a crackling fire, listening to the slow heartbeat of the heart machine. On the left and right of me are the hand and brain of the people. Which is which? Keep listening and find out. <laughs> On this episode, <laughs> I'm, enjoy- I, I'm, I'm joined by a new guest, my good friend, longtime friend, Richard Bacon, also known as Rich. Rich, how are you doing? I'm doing well. How are you, Ray? Pretty good. Rich, you're a new guest to the podcast, and I've known you for a long time, like I just said, uh, and I've always known you to be a big fan of science fiction and fantasy. I can, remember, I can recall uh, uh, chilling out of my, my parents' house late at night when Jurassic Park came out, and uh, Steven Spielberg had just mastered uh, CGI and, and uh, did all this stuff with dinosaurs, and we talked about how it would be cool for them to make Lord of the Rings. And now that they did Jurassic Park, Lord of the Rings seemed uh, surely possible. And here we are many years later, and they've done it. It uh, keeps on advancing. It does. Um, but just for the audience's benefit, what's your, you know, general interest in science fiction and fantasy? Do you have, like, favorite authors or directors or movies that really spoke to you through the years? Well, frankly, the Internet probably knows me from several other pad- podcasts. You might remember from the history of Rome, Jim Rome, or, you know, Tales from MySpace. But my, I was actually uh, more interested in... Uh, a lot of the, actually, your, your previous subjects. So uh, I've been a big Dune fan. Oh, Alas, yeah. I, I, I ended it when uh, Brian Herbert decided to take over uh, from his father. That uh, They didn't quite uh, go the direction I've wanted. Um, but I've enjoyed just about anything I can get my hands on. So I, I will run the gamut from fantasy. I've been a, been a Hobbit Lord of the Ring guy. I've, of course, been a Star Wars uh person i've and uh gone through the ups and downs of shall we say that tale telling my daughter is now brainwashed with the tales of flash gordon nice she drives my wife nuts on a nightly basis by demanding to read the sunday comic versions of flash gordon uh from the 1930s i've got the original alex i've got the alex raymond uh sunday volumes that he did from 1938 all the way through the end of the war isn't that what inspired lucas it sure is. He he was yeah. actually trying to get Flash Gordon rights. They wouldn't give it to him, so he made up something else. Ah, you consider yourself a fan of Star Trek as well? I always thought you were. Certainly. Yeah, yeah. D- is there a favorite version of Star Trek you have, like the originals or the Next Generation or any of the other? Options? Oh, I, I'm probably the worst kind. I I I pick and choose. So I mean, I frankly, I'm I I, I would like to think that I enjoy the good parts and and try and leave the bad parts. I mean, Star Trek the motion picture was awful and. Uh, mm. But I enjoyed the reboot, you know. So you just you like Star Trek, all the universes. It just depends on the episodes or the yeah. the version. It's, yeah, it's like anything else. Mm-hmm. It's like a dinner. Look, you can say you like steak, but if somebody cooks it badly, you're not going to like it. Good point. Good point. Well, welcome aboard this uh, crazy train as we uh, cover a, another science fiction uh, topic tonight. But we'll, before we get to that, I'll welcome our other guest, uh, returning champion. <laughs> and uh, one of the original uh, hosts of the podcast, although it was a short-lived tour, 
James Rauch. It was. It was. Hi, uh, everybody. Welcome back. Thank you. Thank you. It's good to be back, kind of. Now, um, Jim was uh, on the podcast the first three episodes. We did, uh, what do we do, Clockwork Orange, we did The Running Man, and we did uh, uh, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, and then you quickly exited the I podcast. Bailed out. I bailed out quick. I only did three episodes? Yeah. and Well, yeah. And then we, we covered your whole bailout when you returned the last time for Clive Barker's, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, what, what was it? Uh, Hellraiser. Hellraiser. Hellraiser, yeah, yeah that's yeah. right. You came back and you explained your long absence. You would think I would have learned my lesson then when I came back for Hellraiser, but alas, I sit here again. Jim's uh, enjoyed a... Under your uh, <laughs> scrutiny. Jim, in, in, all, in all fairness, you're hosting it, and there's a bat, by the way. Oh, nice. Yeah, we I have a bat you. on the podcast. We have bats. Dude, maybe the mics will pick them up. I don't probably not. And I'd like to say that, you know, it was quite quite the journey to, to just come to this podcast in, indeed. I mean, I've seen things on my way here I haven't seen in a long time. I've seen... No, I, gnomes? Did I, you I see saw, a gnome garden? I did see. That's how I knew that I was at the right house and I didn't <laughs> ring the doorbell. But I Good, saw... Because the doorbell doesn't work, so... <laughs> I, I was expecting to see Ryan running through the fields of the shotgun because I actually saw some pheasants. Oh, uh, really? On the way down, I saw nice. I saw a gentleman uh, walking his motorcycle, which was broken, uh, down the sidewalk, I might add, <laughs> uh, and such. It had stars and stripes on it. And, uh, you know, again, there were, and, and then I walked through the... Uh, the I, I think I saw a drifter when I was walking out here. I think I saw someone walking along the road. Might have been a drifter. I, I don't know. <laughs> no idea. We'll it's find out. It's uh, a wild country out here. Yeah. Welcome, guys. I'm glad you could make it out. You're my first uh, visitors. Well, that being said, it, you have a beautiful home, and I New envy boat. your property because this this is this is nice to be out here. It's a nice nice view. We have a good shot of the moon and the sunset every night, so it's uh, it's really nice out here to be away from the hustle and bustle a little bit. Yeah, you can hear the 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 city a little bit in the background. We it, it, we're, we're sitting in front of like is that a farm field across from us? Yeah, it's a soybean field. Okay, uh, so it, it's fallow right now, right? It's, it's or it's not being uh, no. it's not, nothing's growing right no, now. No, those are yeah, that's soybeans. soybeans. Yeah, oh, it's is all it? Soybeans. Oh, well, okay, it's, well, while you were busy dark. setting up, we were talking about the soybeans oh. and the cat poop. So, oh, yeah. and the, the cat poop's out well, there fertilizing. Yeah, that's, that's, right. that's, that's, that's his contribution to fertilizing the field. We all have to do our part, even the cats. They appreciate it when I throw poop in the field. But I like it, it, it in the fertilizer. distance because um, you can see the lights of, uh, is that industry or is that a church? In the that background? is industry and <laughs> is, is just over the cornfield. So. Okay. What was that one of that one? Yeah. Okay. And you can see the electrical wires and stuff and the moon is just a slight crescent up in the sky with the first stars coming out and there's a plane going by. So... We're out here, nestled and and ready to to talk about a, a story. Ready to dig into Metropolis. That's right. Metropolis, which, which is nothing like the skyscape that we can see right now. <laughs> no, <laughs> we are a lot less peaceful. We are, of course, going to be discussing on this episode the book and the film Metropolis. The book was written by Dea Van Arbu, and the film was directed by her husband Fritz Lang, her husband at the time. And uh, the book and the movie have the same name. They came out a long, long time ago, and we'll be we'll be getting into all that. This is the first portion of our episode. We're gonna we're gonna do the book and the author. So to kick things off, I thought we'll all go around real quick and just give like an opening kind of comment, a uh, one sentence summary of your thoughts on the uh, on the book. I'll start things off. I don't usually, but I'll start things off this time and uh, see if I can read my uh, notes here. So to sum things up, my my take on the book, just in real quick summary, is a romanticized class struggle colored by religious and occult mythology with implacable villains full of old-world venom and heroes in glorious melodrama, all set in the vast mechanized metropolis, a city dug as deep in the ground as it towers in the skies. So that's just my quick take on it to kind of set up my comments for the book. Rich, let's go to you next. What's your kind of opening salvo to start things off? I decided that I was going to cut away all of the extra jute from this and cut down to what the real story is. And my argument is that the real story here is revenge. And the real plot of this book is that Rotwing, Wang, whatever, wants vengeance on the two men who stole the love of his life. One mm-hmm. stole one stole her heart, and the other stole her life. And everything else around it is window dressing. It's one heck of a window dresser, but that is that is 
the real plot of this book, and that is going to be my argument for, for this. But Because it's an argument, man. It's already an argument. It's, it's an argument. It's I'm ar- taking it there. But, it's, it's already already. Uh, you know what? This book, it was so... There's so much going on in this book. All right, let me so let me stop you there. Out. Where I think you passed your one sentence summary. <laughs> let me count. No, I got I got a lot of commas. Well, you'll get you'll get it's to. It's written it. down here. We'll get to the rest. Beam to you. I, I know you struggle with this. It's just it, just sum up your thoughts real quick on uh, on the book. Well, uh, melodrama. It's kind of a, a word that you threw out there. I didn't write down any notes. I'm gonna That's kinda fine. wing it tonight. We love it when you do. It's uh it was a very over dramatic, uh almost theatrical book in a lot of ways that uh just the the style of the writing, the verbosity of it was almost like just intimidating to me. I uh I think it was more a product of the country of Germany at that time. The depression was fierce and I think the working man was, was just getting their ass kicked basically and it was a I think it was a hero story I, I don't think it was so much revenge I, I didn't read it like that I read it almost as like a as like a hero story as you know a mediator was uh, was born and and somehow came in between the heart or not it became the heart of the the brain and the hands and I, I don't know I, I didn't really enjoy reading it I'm not gonna lie all right let me stop you there on that little fun tidbit. <laughs> as, uh, I'll get into it more later. As oh, the, sure, he does three or four sentences. He doesn't get a comp. <laughs> as the machine growls above us and beckons us into the story. So let's let's just move on to the discussion on the uh, author, the biography uh, portion of the show, and then we can get into the book and, and, and everyone's different uh, views on it. So the story was written by Dia Van Arbo, I'm probably mispronouncing her name, but she was born December 27th, 1888. She died July 1st, 1954. She had, I guess my take on it, she had a Bavarian sort of upbringing um, the countryside. Her father was a Prussian army officer and a forester and a gamekeeper. Uh, she credits this later for her love of animals. I don't know if that wasn't, uh, that wasn't really apparent in the story at all. She had an uh, interest in writing from an early age. Um, her first short story was sold at the age of nine, her first novel at the age of 15. So she was, uh, an, she was an author in her own right. Against her family's wishes, she decided to pursue acting. She went to the School of Performing Arts at uh, the du- Dusseldorf Playhouse when she was young. She was 17. And she kind of pursued this uh, for a while until she met a leading actor named Rudolf Klein. Klein. Rudolf Klein <laughs> Rog? I'm not sure how to pronounce his name, but she married him. They married in uh, 1914, and then she kind of turned more to her writing. She, let's see, she eventually was on a film. What was the film that she was on? She, oddly enough, was, was kind of a feminist without being a feminist. Cause she, she, yeah. She, she, she was against she, pardon me she was for abortion she was for but she was quote there's a famous quote from her about yeah being pro-abortion and and such because men can't understand the burden of actually you know the pains of childbirth and the and the cost of actually raising the the children and such but it was it was making sure that that you know men shouldn't be aren't in a position to understand it and therefore should not be regulating and which was an interesting uh, especially viewpoint where she was pushing that because this was this was in the 30s and I mean that's uh, in well, yeah, my understanding she, uh, that's, a, that's an odd odd thing to do. But I mean, you know, we're talking about a, a woman. She published over forty books. I mean, you know, yeah. it's, and we're talking. This is an age where this is an investment. You know, this is this is literally people are paying to print books and and things like that. So it's it's uh, you you have to you have to uh, be be profitable or you will not be published again. Yeah. And uh, but then yeah she but being an actress I think that she was probably trying to generate some of her own content and she she was also uh, was a playwright and and then turned screenwriter as as that uh, era evolved. Yes, and then here's what I was looking for. In 1919, she was hired by director Joe May to collaborate on a screenplay uh, known as The Legend of Saint Simplicity. It was successful, and he ev- eventually hired her to collaborate with Fritz Lang on the 1918 novel. Her, her novel, The Indian Tomb, 
um, which May directed. And then during that film, I believe, her and Fritz Lang had an affair because he was married already at the time. I think his wife discovered the affair. and Oh, she walked in on them. She walked in on them. Excellent. I forget what her name was. I have notes. There, there was, I actually found a pretty good website that, that talked about her. There's, there's not a lot of... T- you know, it, it had an unfortunate ending, so I'm not sure we really need to remember her name past that point. Well, I, yeah, I guess the point is she, she saw them, ha- that they had an affair, and then she, the, the story is she went and shot herself in the bathtub with Fritz. Uh, literally in the same apartment with Fritz's uh, old uh, service uh, yeah, he, he was in, Yeah, his old World War I uh, Shot p- herself pistol. in the chest. That sounded really suspect to me, actually, reading uh, that. Everyone, everyone thought that. Yeah. It sounded like maybe she was murdered. That was the question. And the, I don't think that any charges got brought up. I think the, it was questioned, maybe, by the police. But he was already a popular director at the time, and I think looking back on it, I saw this one website. I'll put a link on the uh, on our website of uh, this guy who talked about it. I didn't see any primary sources from it, but they talked about that maybe you know Fritz Lang is a producer, kind of maybe talked to the police and you know talked them out of doing any pressing any charges or anything. I mean, I hate to say it, nobody shoots themselves in the chest. It's always in the head with suicides because yeah, they're yeah. killing the they're killing the brain. They're killing the the great yeah. brain, the great thinker. You know. Nobody. Well, Dave Duerson did because he wanted to save his brain to uh, have it studied, but that was an uh, exception. And since we want to keep this a happy, peppy thing, I think we'll keep on discussing more ways that people have shot themselves in the head. <laughs> we afterwards, should. we should. I, I've got I've got some good stories for you afterwards. <laughs> well, but in any case, uh, his wife shot her, shot herself, or you know something suspicious might have happened. But they, they uh, and Fritz Lang were never charged, and they eventually married. And they were married for 13 years, and that started off a long collaboration between the two where, you know, she would write stuff and, and, and work with him on turning it into screenplays. And they, and they did many, many things. Fritz was known as a philanderer, and he cheated on her probably repeatedly throughout their time, even though they, you know, well, despite their success. Eventually, now... Well, we can kind of get more into this in in Fritz Lang's uh, history, but I guess to surmise it is, well, there's been sort of uh, she has some leanings with the Nazis, and definitely at the time, Fritz told a story at some point saying that you know she was pro Nazi and he wasn't because he had some Jewish background, which we can get into later. But so he he eventually fled Germany. She stays. Now, after the years of history have passed, I think it's probably a little bit more obvious that the reason the marriage broke up, it, it might have been ideological, but it, I, I think the affairs on both sides actually is probably what the main contributor was because eventually Fritz catches her in the act of cheating on him with uh, a young Indian man. Her future husband. Who she eventually married. Right. Right. Oddly enough, one of uh, Fritz's and her uh, her commonalities were their uh, adoration of Indian cultures. So. Yes, and they collaborated on uh, screenplays and movies mm-hmm. about India. Uh, they had a bunch of movies related to that. I believe there's actually some that are played uh, every day on on a holiday in Germany. It, oh, really? It, I believe they did a Dr. remake. Dr. Magusa. There's there's two of them, and I, and I, I there's like a part one and a part two, and, and yeah. I believe they're that popular. But anyway. Yeah, and I think one of them, they might be like four or five hours long or something. They had, they had some really long movies in there. Well, man, if you let that guy let people talk, I, I believe that it would be them. So Fritz discovered her in bed shortly after they, they divorced. She marries uh, the young Indian gentleman who was, I think, a Gandhi uh, sympathizer. Now, so people bring... A Gandhi sympathizer? Well, well, people bring that up as... as Everyone a, loves Gandhi. A counterpoint to her being a Nazi. Not the British. She... she uh, <laughs> She married this Indian guy, when, which, you know, the Nazis, in theory, wouldn't be for. I believe uh, it was a secret marriage in their oh, regard. Yeah, right, right. But I, I also read that, I don't know if you know about this, Rich, that uh, that the uh, some movements in India might have um, been pro-Germany, pro-the Nazis, because they were, in theory, maybe going to get some support from the Nazis uh, in, against the British. Okay. Uh, I didn't really look into that a lot, but... I don't know. There is, so there might be some some leanings and you know why there was a connection. But anyways, she married that guy. Fritz took off for for eventually for America, and she stayed put. 
she worked on some some movies after Fritz left. She described her work mostly as a scenerist. I think she directed maybe two movies. And I think the movies started to get more propagandist, obviously, because the, the Nazi power rose at that point. And eventually, we know, we know what happened with the World War II, and she ended up in a British prison camp. And she, really? Yeah. She was eventually cleared and quote-unquote denazified of, <laughs> of her... Uh, I would love to know that process. Of any of her Nazi leanings, and she was allowed to, you know, return to, to film and stuff like that. But it, I think history hasn't really looked kindly to her as much as Fritz Lang, or, well, you know, he's controversial in his own right. But, you know, there's not much more about her, and I wonder if her staying in Germany, Germany kind of tainted her uh, reputation, you know, for history. She um, eventually, she died, what did she die of? Dysentery. <laughs> uh, she died on the 50, Oregon Trail. She died on July 1st, uh, 1954, after she fell and suffered a hip injury. Yeah, she was giving a talk, I think. All right. And I, I did see one anecdote saying that in the even in the 50s, in her room, in apartment, I don't, I, I again didn't see a primary source for this, but there was a, allegedly a picture of Hitler and a picture of Gandhi in her room. Really? That's an yeah. odd combo. Yeah, I don't know, you know... If that's 100 percent true, and and, and 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 why? I mean, it would have been in the 50s. It would have been after everything. So, I, I don't know. She she stuck around with Germany. She and I think she paid the price for it. She you know she did marry an Indian gentleman. I think that it does uh, lay some credence uh, against her being a complete Nazi sympathizer. As I mean, I listen to some podcasts, and people will totally just dismiss her and say, well, she was a Nazi sympathizer and that's pretty much all they say about her i i, I believe she's probably was more complicated than that well, tr- i'm truthfully, sure she I think... was i'm sure she was i mean back in the 30s the nazis were just a political party they weren't the evil that you know destroyed the world so it's 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 a step-by-step process it's a, it's a slow progression towards you know the horror well, that everyone knows now she chose to stay there she didn't leave like fritz but you know their marriage had other problems besides that you know with the, the infidelities go rampant infidelities on both sides so you know I, she she probably had some sympathies for the nazis but i don't i i think that you know she was probably just a complicated person and she got swept up in things oh i'm I w- sure i wish your writing was a bit more complicated it might have made it more interesting yeah. <laughs> i don't know if it could have been much more complicated yeah. well it <laughs> didn't get anywhere for, I, I will say this <laughs> Fritz Lang eventually, and I know we're not getting into him too much, but he eventually, I think when his biography was done, he had the author tone down stuff about her being a Nazi, and he, he seemed to look more fondly about their past marriage, even though it was years before, you know, he died later after her. But um, I think he also felt she got like a short shrift by history with, uh, you know, with accused of her being a big Nazi sympathizer. So, I mean, that's pretty much what I have to say about her. I don't know if you guys have anything else to, to talk about her as far as her biography. One thing I was reading that was, it it seemed like she was a, a woman of conflict almost. Like, there were, it was like, there was a huge disparity between the different aspects of her personality. Like, she was a Nazi sympathizer and yet she loved animals and there was this, you know, and she, she was like a anti-feminist and she didn't agree with the idea that women should be should should step out of their place in a way to like demonstrate themselves but yet she was an author and it was there was just a and she was pro-abortion and there was just such a huge gap between the the points of interest or the points of i guess yeah i saw it that she was described as more of like a housefrau yeah it, and she was there were stories about her on set being very kind and bring, bringing food to people yeah she, she wasn't she bringing made, food she was running the she basically ran the kitchen yeah she, she ran but the as, kitchen as, and as she cut potatoes earlier, and uh, jim as you mentioned earlier the um uh you know not only the depression is going on but the punishment of the of the german country by the treaty of versailles i mean like we're talking about the 20s so during the 20s the germans were in depression because of the the oppressive uh, payments that they had to do, the punishment uh, it, it, as a result and of the after World War One, country was World suffering War I. miserably. Oh, it yes. was and, and it was they, beyond anything, almost beyond what we experienced in the 30s. It was true, but we need to make sure the audience the audience doesn't always know 
that that was going on in the 20s compared to when we talk about the depression of the 30s. So well, it was no, almost an advantage. so much attention gets paid to what the Nazis did and the horrors that they sort of put on the world that you forget about the place they were in the 20s and 30s that allowed that led up to that that allowed right. that party to come into power that the country was just in total disarray and mm-hmm. it had to have been almost a conflict of interest for a lot of people because you want to support your country doing better and yet the methods and the ways that they were employing to gain sort of a more of a foothold in the the world's politics were turned out to be such a just a shitty thing that it's it's almost like you forget how the little steps along the way that that got that got them there so you think like you're saying that maybe she got swept up in in all oh, that. for sure mm-hmm. i mean to uh to be a part of a society that is just like rubble and then to to see things being built and improvements being made you almost would tend to ignore the the sort of the racial undertones of it and the well, mm-hmm. just the you know keep, yeah. keep in mind the Allies did not advance into Germany with the trench warfare. You know it it, 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 it ended on the on the the Western Front, never ended back into the country. So I mean it it, it was not as devastated as it was during the Second World War, but it was devastated economically mm-hmm. by the punitive measures of of the Treaty of Versailles, and and that set up it, where where we're at. And that's it was it was the it was really devastating economic punishment because they literally had to pay penalty fees to everyone else right. and you know we could go into how that actually backed up to the franco-prussian war of 1870 because they the the frank when the when the prussians basically took over well they they beat france they did punishment ties so it was this for that but it turned out that france did that to the prussians back in 1810 or 1807 anyway it, it, it's a long history mm-hmm. whatever blah 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 but rich was a history major you know, it, it's it, it's. But it, it, the point is that during the twenties, it was bad. But she actually lobbied the studios to pay to feed the crew. So I mean, like yeah. she was actually and she lobbied. It for was them. humanitarian yeah. in that effort. You know, yeah. it's not necessarily that she was she being was motherly. She wanted she wanted the people, people to eat. <laughs> yes. So it was working that in rather than than being a housefrau. It was she was she was being a humanitarian. Mm, and mm. and getting her getting her crew taken care of. These people are doing her work. She's trying to get them get them taken care of and right. That, that was. That was mm-hmm. I just think when I listen to, like I said, when I listen to some other podcasts, it, it's very easy to just sum her up as an. I mean, I I thought I've heard another podcast say, well, she was a Nazi, and that like, oh, that, I'm sure, and that was it. That's kind of all they say about her. But I, I I feel like you know she was a person, and she was probably more complex than just that. Also, in you were talking about a German language writer from the early 1920s. There's probably little English uh, scholarship on it, so I mean, there's not much yeah. that we can really find on it I in saw general. That she might have been the highest-paid screenwriter in Germany at some point. Certainly, the highest women's. Oh no, women's she was she was she was popular, man. She yeah. she really could do stuff. And, yeah, and her and Fritz were like a, a modern day. Uh, they were like, uh... Yeah, we're not bailing you out. Come on. They were a modern-day Gota. They were a modern-day, uh, what would you say, like, La Harbu? I don't know what that <laughs> like, is. Like, uh, <laughs> uh, like when, uh, Jennifer Lopez and, uh, what's oh. his name? Was for, like, modern-day Gota. Yeah, Alex Mod- Rodriguez? Gota, Gota wasn't modern-day at all, was he? No, J-Lo no. and, uh, Ben Affleck, what would they call him? Like, He's a modern-day Ben Affleck. When they combine really. their names, what do they say, like, uh... J-Lo. No. Yeah, I, I got it wrong. Anyways, they were a power couple. <laughs> <laughs> they were a power couple. So J Lo. I think that's you know uh, w- that pretty much covers that. So we'll leave her bio there. So moving things on, we'll get into the book here. The book was written by her. It was called Metropolis. When it first came out, it was serialized in a, uh, a magazine called, Il- I don't know the German pronunciation of this, it's called Illustrated Splat, which means Illustrated Sheet. That came out in 1925. I believe the novel came out in 26. But they did the serialization first. A lot of stuff was serialized back then. That was a long time ago. It was a very long time ago. True, but it might have, it might have actually increased the circulation to do it that way. 
I mean, it, again, it's 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 a cheaper mode of publication. It might reach more people by doing it. And well, and they were serializing a lot of things back then. I mean, serializing things in magazines. I mean, uh, the, the Gutenberg Bible, the, for example. Well, the pulp, the whole pulp <laughs> movement, and uh, you know, like Conan and all that stuff was serialized first, and and all that. And you well, know, that's where he went to make money. I mean, Conan Doyle didn't go straight to novels. He went straight to the straight to the uh, Charles Dickens. Might was he serialized first too? Charles Dickens. Was what about far earlier, Frank? actually, and yeah. and Dickens actually to make money. Dickens used to go and do live readings of his of his work yeah, just to yeah. make money. So the story is it's set in an advanced city. Uh, there's various disputes about the, the the time period. You know, one one source says it was 2026. It involves a an underground society of laborers, and then there's like sort of the above ground society of the the bourgeoisie. Uh, the son of the, the city's father, the patriarch, falls in love with a, a girl who is among the underground society, and there is sort of a clash between the two societies as they uh, fight over, you know, control and stuff like that. So that that's a brief synopsis of the story, and what we can get more into it as Jim uh, throws more wood onto the heart machine and, and stokes things up here. <laughs> I was trying to be quiet. It's fine. Did it work? You're you're feeding the machine. You're feeding the machine. So let's let's uh, let's start things off uh, just talking about the prose itself. There's a lot of what I, what I noted was a lot of like religious and occult themes, and there I feel like the story is pretty heavy with description. In description, in the sense that it's focused on making these uh, allusions to myths and to religious symbology. I mean, the Our Father itself is quoted a lot, uh, the prayer, the Christian prayer. And there's also a lot of other religions that are kind of shouted out uh, uh, throughout this book. One one of the machines is uh, described as looking like Ganesh. Yes, right. And there you go. And then they they deal with Moloch. I'm just pouring straight from the growler here, so yeah. yeah. What do you got? What do you got over there? I have. Yeah, are you holding out on us? I am. This is my favorite beer. It's, it's German. It's German. This is Eyinger. It's a it's a Brau Brauweisse. So it's a it's a wheat beer. Figured German beer would be oh. appropriate. I'll have our, some of that next when I finish. Uh, what what did you bring, Rich? This is a uh, hoppy rye. It's uh, called Royal Red from Imperial Oak. Oh, nice, a local brewery. So, but but let's talk about the the, the prose itself. I I feel like the writing, it, it it's a slow burn. The the prose, it's it's not particularly difficult, but because she's constantly trying to bring in these, I think she was big on mythology. She knew her mythology, but she's constantly trying to bring it in and and, and make these sort of big broad brush brushed strokes uh, to, to to call into all this stuff to bring all this symbology into the story. And it, and I think it sort of slows down the narrative. I, I, how did you feel about it, that? I definitely agree with you. Okay. I kind of think of it as she is a woman who has grand visions, Mm -hmm. and she can put the visions into your head. I mean, like, there was a scene later on, I mean, in the plot, where people are riding in an airplane, all right? So this is 1925, 26, you know, you've got a, 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 you know, a Fokker tri-motor, if those were even around there, but I mean, you know, air, airplane, air travel is new and dangerous, and you've got people doing it, it's kind of exotic, but I mean... The images that she put in your head where all of a sudden it's spinning a field and then somebody comes out in a parachute. I literally could just see that, especially, you know, against Beam's, you know, wonderful view here. Where you could just see the, the, the guy floating down against an, and, I, and, and such. Her, she put that image in my head. And in a lot of her scenes, she did a great job of putting the images in my head. I think she was very good at capturing visions and getting them in there. Uh, I agree. And in other aspects, I found your writing was lacking. But but when it comes to the descriptive of putting what what scenery almost like the, the what's going on in that scene, she could do that. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I kind of felt like the chapters would end on good notes. Like she'd bring in the action, and you could see things happening. 
or there'd be good character reveals. But in between, there was all this, like, layered on symbolism and stuff that slowed things down. Yes, and she definitely relied on the symbolism to tell, they uh, to almost tell the story for her. Yeah. In some ways. So, I mean, in, for that, example... That, she, that her audience would know, you know... Yeah, she relied upon that to fill in the gaps. And, uh, you know, for example, she would bring in the cathedral, and everybody in Germany would know a cathedral. Whether it's Protestant, whether it's Catholic, they know what the devil of cathedral is. Yeah. They know what portions are there. It would go in there. And then they bring up this, this Rotwang's house. And, which I always, which actually was, I, I wanted, it was the most curious part of the book. I, I honestly, I totally agree. His house was by far the the best description that she gave of any environment almost. It was like me. a wizard's house. Yeah, it was. It was and definitely it a wizard's house. so dark. Yeah. And it and so it, oppressive, but in, in mysterious like rooms, like you couldn't just walk in there and know where you're going. Like you had to be led around. Yep, and yes, and it was almost like House of Leaves esque. It was just what's confusion. House of Leaves? What's House of yeah, Leaves? Yeah, you got to uh, tell me what that one is. It's a horror story built. Uh, it it's sort of built around a house, a haunted house. But <laughs> is it of leaves? But it's uh, no, it's just like this oppressive, like multi roomed, multi faceted maze of just horror in a way. And oh, like that serial killer in t- uh, at the, the uh, World Fair here in Chicago. What, yeah, what the, was that guy's name? The uh, Devil in the White City. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like that house that he made. It was, yeah, it was uh, but it was darker than that. It almost, it, it just the imagery, it's like you were saying, Rich, like the the imagery that she presented, it did tell the story for her in a lot of ways and it, it almost sounded like a dirt floor with walls that were the same color and doors that were the same color. Everything was dark and charcoal and just, you know, impossible to navigate. It was, uh, that was the best part of the book, I thought, was her description of that house. Yeah, yeah, and they, and you know, they, they described it initially as, as almost having the, uh, did they call it the Star of Solomon? But they, yeah, they definitely they did, re- yeah. But back yeah. then, that was referred to, but nowadays we would call that the pentagram. Yeah. And that has... Well, that, yeah, the, it mentioned the pentagram, too. It, yeah. it did. And and we we in this day and age take that as a sign of the devil, yeah. and but back in that period it was also it was almost the star of Solomon, and that had different legends that people were more associated with it back at that point in time. Mm. Oh, Sol- that's true. Yeah, the Jewish history almost. I, I mean, I, I I'll, I'll tell you that. what, I I I did not enjoy this book. I mean, I got to be honest, but she does stuff well, and I and I don't want to begrudge her uh, that. And what she does well is setting that scenery. And you know what it really reminded me of, and I don't know whether either of you two uh, have read any of them, is a Mike Mignola Hellboy book. Oh, I no. Mean, oh. I saw the, mo- the movie. The oh, no, no, no. Uh, gentlemen, I've got, I've got, I've, I, I need to get you to, to review some of them. That man knows horror, and he's a, he's a scholar on it. And, I mean, you know, he can set, he can, he, and they're comic books, but he goes back to the, the folklore and he does his homework and does all of it, and that's actually why I isn't that it, isn't wasn't Hellboy found during uh, after World War Two or during World War Two? Well, he's a fictional character, but yes, he was found during <laughs> World War Two. I know, um, he's, I know, he's fictional. But but what they did was uh, the genius of, uh, as far as I was concerned, is they inserted the demon as a as an occult investigator, and we don't want to get too deep into this. But yeah, what I'm trying right. to say is, I consider Mike Mignola to really be a a good. I mean, uh, 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 he really can sculpt scenes. He, I mean, that man can shape images and such. And this woman made me feel like I was in one of those those uh, oh. uh, books. And I cannot give a higher compliment than that in in that terms, especially when we're talking about Rotwang's house, because that really is what it made me feel like. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was by far the most interesting part of the book to me too. Was the description of that house was it was just so oppressive. What about the the dialogue? I, I guess I felt like that di- that was where the mellow, you know, drama was mostly at in the dialogue. It, it felt akin to maybe a film from that time when I read it. Uh, I didn't it was, like the dialogue. It was I, more stilted. It's it's dated. It's, yeah, uh, yeah. And and that goes it was probably not the, even it probably film. it probably was not even natural for the time. It was though. That's the interesting thing. I mean, a lot of you uh, think people talked like the way she, she wrote it. A lot of stories back then were were written to uh like if if you go back historically and look at books and film pre uh birds like pre hitchcock pre marlon brando that's where we're, we're uh, definitely that we're pre yeah, all the, that well well those guys changed the way that stories were told 
And we relate to that now because that's the way everything is told now. But back then, stories were told in such a way that you could step in in the middle. And, and even movie theaters didn't... They didn't start movies at the beginning and then run to the end. Hitchcock changed that. Stories at in, back in the 20s and 30s were designed because movie theaters and... The way, the way that movies were shown back in the 20s and 30s uh, were such that they were run from start to finish, then start to finish, start to finish, and people were allowed to walk in in the middle, and they were sort of encouraged to then sit through and see what they missed when it started over, because the films ran for 12 hours straight, and there was no start time or finish time. So that I think what you're trying to say is that it was kind of like walking into your living room with the TV on. And basically it just kept on that's going. The, yeah, that's the way films were shown. There was no, like, you have to be at the movie at 8 o'clock, you, and the movie will be done at 10. Like, you are supposed to show up when you can, and, and then you'll see what how it started if you miss the first half. Like, the, the dialogue is, is very disjointed, and uh, it's just different. It's it's totally yeah. different from what we're used it, to, uh, yeah. which was a problem for it's me. Not, it's not very natural it's not. sounding. I think it's more akin to, like, plays. Oh, I, it's very theatrical, yeah, and... Yeah, it, it is totally. You agree, Rich? Yeah, I, I found it. I mean, in all fairness, I do not know whether to attribute that to the translation. Yeah, that's a good um, point. You know, because we well, see, I don't think it was the translation. Because if you if you read like like Gota is a perfect example, and things that were translated from German into English, there's a pretty solid translation that. Well, but, uh, but this people, woman has not been very studied. This this translation we read is uh, the version I bought, the, and it's from the twenties. Yeah, it's from the from the the twenties. There's a newer translation that got bad reviews on Amazon. It looked like someone just did it on their own. With a, it's not like a publishing house, but like I mean, you know, we covered Jules Verne on this podcast. I know he's suffered from some bad translation. And you, you've actually told me, and I've, I've got to go back and, and actually try some of those because you, uh, the what you sent me was basically communicating that oh my lord, like they they butchered this thing. Yeah, and, and yeah, and I've, so, I found Jules Verne to struggle to get through, so I could yeah. believe that. Yeah, so I don't know if. If this is a good translation or not, and I don't think she's popular enough for for scholars to really look at it and say that. But you know, time moves on, I suppose. Yeah, it is what it is, I guess. Like Rich said, it keeps moving. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, translations aside, since we don't really know about that, another thing I noted is, uh, and I was talking about to Rich about this earlier, is I felt like there was a lot of classic kind of you know myth mythological story conflicts in this. There's star-crossed lovers. There's there's a I call it I, I don't have the right term for this I call it the old switcheroo where where you have the 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 city's patriarch son switch places with a worker change clothes and takes his place there's the the son against the father there's it's the, like trading places <laughs> the trading Modern places day tra- trading yeah. places there's the jilted lover there's a messiah savior prophecy there's you know there's various things there's a class struggle there's there's now she was inspired by Frankenstein and there is like a Frankenstein s you know there aspect. is yeah I was thinking about that uh, especially with the yeah with the robot yeah. uh, sort of stepping in and becoming this like it's almost like a golem story going back to yeah. like ancient Judaism like yeah. the, the historical golem it's there there is a she lot ties of that. into that very well with the robot so there's all these kind of classic conflicts it's, it's almost like she hits on everything i mean you look at like the the golem the, the frankenstein aspect of it with the robot with the which they call parody and they call futura whatever i mean you could have a whole story just about that but that's just one element of the story then you have the jilted lovers like romeo and juliet with frederer and uh maria i mean that's just another aspect and then you have the the, the jilted lovers i mean the fact that the mad scientist uh rotwing and Frederick's father, the, the city patriarch, Joe Frederson. You got Joe Frederson, you got Frederick. Make sure you keep that straight, as Richard pointed out. <laughs> it, I got confused reading it. it. I, I thought that that was very interesting that she had all these depths because the, the fact that the, the mad scientist and the city father, they have a real conflict between them. They, they somehow are still working together to run the city. <laughs> they cluck their beards. But, but... The, the, and say what's to be done with this Homer Simpson? <laughs> but the the scientist, the mad scientist, he is pissed off because Joe Frederson stole his wife. Hell, and uh, that came out of nowhere. That whole hell thing. I I was surprised uh, the H-E-L, story hell, took yeah. that direction because there was it, it, it seemed like the narrative was flowing so well, and then all of a sudden there was it was a lot of layers. It's like you said, they, there's all these things hit going a on. A lot of layers, but she doesn't. Even though the book is not super long, and even though it's sort of 
feel slow. It's not... <laughs> she doesn't take the time to really get into all these I'll things. I'll be honest. I thought she was on drugs. I'm not going to lie. Like, if you read Why the do you first, say that? Why do you if say you that? read the first chapter, just the visual sort of hallucinogenic uh, qualities of the things that she was saying, like when he's playing the organ, like... It, and then she mentions drugs later. When you look oh, at, I forgot about the organ. That was a big okay. The, the so, history so, so, of drugs, but, like back then, uh, drugs were not nearly as well known as they are now. Tolkien and they was were, accused of that too, but he was not drugs. Rich, Rich, what, what do you got? What, what was the point of the organ scene? What do it you was think? drug. I think it was drug related. I think it was hallucinogen. <laughs> I, I mean, really do. To be honest, that's like one of the. That's what I almost describe as she has like this vision that she wants to have in there because she can see a great dramatic. I'm playing the organ scene to the heavens. Yeah, I'm I didn't getting get it exhausted either. by this, but there's literally no purpose for it. There is yeah. none. You're I right. mean, like I, I think right. it almost was because she doesn't a, come back to it. No, and that's yeah. uh, that's something I want to address later. It, it and it be, but it's one of those things. Where I think it was a she hidden... had in her head. It's a cool thing when you read it. Yeah. You actually felt like okay, I can see this maniac. I don't know. You don't know who these people are. It's like the first scene of the book playing this organ. But then it's like it's just gone. It's it, th- there. I'm like, all right. Are you I trying think to tell that, me he's deep I think that he likes parts music? of the no. story were meant for people other than us. I really do. Like, what do you I think, mean? What does that mean? I think that oh. a lot of the the things that she touched on were designed in such a way that they were supposed to suggest drug use to uh, maybe mean, she, maybe she, in the popular culture of the time. She does have drug use in the story. She does. She brings it in directly uh, into the y- story. Yoshara? Is it Yosh- yeah, Yoshara? Yoshira, it's a, yeah. which is the red light district in Tokyo. Yeah. It was I an actual place. She, I think that she included a lot of that to sort of... I mean, if, if you look at drug use in general, it's it's more of a liberal-minded thing. And, and a lot of popular culture includes drug use liberally to sort of... But this is the 20s. I, I mean, I guess I people are doing opiates at that well, point, they right? they were, and drugs were a lot stronger back then. They weren't illegal, and, and even, I, I mean, I guess. you look at, like, Hitler, supposedly he was on drugs, and there was a lot of, uh, like, he was on meth. If, if you look at ever the, the drugs that he was taking, there was just are, are a either? lot of, like, hard shit that people were doing that wasn't categorized the mm. way that society categorizes it now. It was more accepted. Like, cocaine was... Like, you look at Freud, that was, like, early, like, 1919, 1920. Like, he was doing cocaine. I mean, cocaine Holmes was on it. There was, I think... Yeah, it's Sherlock Holmes. I think Rich, what do you was, got? Well, I was going to say, uh, pardon me, this is an odd aside, but are either of you watching Archer Danger Island? No. No. Oh! I heard it's great. All right. I know you're a big it's, Archer it's, fan. Well, I'm a huge Archer fan, but there's actually a scene, spoiler alert, dun, 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 anyway... <laughs> where 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 the, there are some Germans in this, but they end up breaking out. There's Damn some Germans. stormtroopers land, and they end up breaking out basically some amphetamines and cocaine that are mixed into pills, and they take them. I don't know whether the stormtroopers actually took them before you know uh, trench assaults or not, and I'm curious to know whether they did. And and in one case, they had Cyril basically mash him down into a into a powder and then snort it, and then basically goes crazy. But I'm actually curious as whether they did. You mentioned that that. Hitler was was doing X Y Z. I was just wondering. I, I, I'm not sure. You know how prevalent that is. You know, you I think it was very prevalent back then. Well, okay, I think a lot I, of her. But let's. I'm not sure. We, we can't prove the drug use. I, so. I don't anyway. think. Okay, maybe I, she definitely has drug use in the story. I mean, in the Yushara district, in the the Club of Sons or whatever. There's. They, she mentions some drug. I can't remember the name of it. But to me, okay, I'll give you the drug use. But the drug use is just like one more thing. Along with all these other elements I'm talking about. I think about. it was an identifier to popular culture at the time. Yeah, to but sort I, of to bring me, the story into their realm. That's, yeah, but but to me, okay, fine. But it to me, it's just like one more thing she just dumps on this garbage heap of mythology and symbols. Another layer. Uh, yeah, but yes, but it's not... It's not important. It's not, it's not artfully crafted into the story in a meaningful way. I think you're right. Yeah, and yeah. and and there's two ways I like to think of this. One, okay. as much as you like to separate this into a book and then a movie, mm-hmm. you know, this is a woman who writes books. But at that point, most of her, I think, her money was coming well, from screenwriting. Well, her husband you made can't, the you movie, can't. so it was designed almost together. You would think. Well, it was. Yeah. It was. Well, I think it was written to be one. Yes. So I think I think that she it, it was there, and and you know we'll leave that discussion for the so next. So this for the is the ultimate middle two. finger to your separation of books versus movies. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, but this I mean, was done together. Well, no, 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 but I mean, like, there's there's different arguments for it because I mean, like, you're you, this might be the earliest discussion of a Michael Crichton like situation. Mm-hmm. You got someone who's almost writing stories for the purposes of making them into into movies. Yeah, but 
uh, she's literally married to the director. I mean, so do you, know, you th- do you think that she's just dumping the symbology in there just to fill up pages? I'm I'm not sure it's fair to say she's dumping the symbology. But I'll tell you what, you started mentioning everything in the plot points. You started mentioning boy, girl, you know, the, yeah. the, the the entire litany you had there. She has just about every kind of plot to put into there. They yeah. all get dumped in. There's a witch hunt. I think she was and widening she was widening like, the attention span so that everyone would feel like this applies to me. I think And this is a part of my life and I fit into this story and then she hits with the, the I'm, denouement. Gonna, I'm going with it from the Hollywood point of view. I think she and her husband were the whatever the the Ufa power couple, and they were trying to make the blockbuster. Ufa was the was the distributor. Yeah, yeah, they're just, and, yeah they're the production. and uh, yeah. I think that they were trying to make the blockbuster. They were going to put everything in this thing. It yeah. was we are dumping it all in here. It's got everything, people, and that's where this kind of went. Because, but I think some of it's her. It's, oh, no, 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 I'm not trying to really do But I mean, like... You know what I'm saying? But, like, because, I mean, I think she was a student of mythology. Oh, no, no, no. The, I'm sorry. The symbology is the way that she tells the story. Yeah. But she's got almost every story in there. Yeah. And that's where I'm trying to say, like, she was trying to put everything in there. Yeah. I mean, you've got worker revolts. You've got air... You've got you've got daring airplane escapes. You've, you've got, got love yeah. triangles. You've got you've love got, triangles. Yeah, you've got you've got love stories. Patricide potentially. You've got a million. You're right. Yes, yes. But it, it, but she doesn't like it. dogs and cats living together. Mass hysteria. <laughs> I mean, it's just insane. <laughs> but she doesn't, and, and yet it all feels slow when you read it. And oh, it's, it's not, terrible. And it's not a long <laughs> book. It's not, and, and it's not. Look, and I don't think it's just slow because of the fact that it's written in the 1920s or. I'm not sure that I would forgive her the translation, the fact that it's an English translation. I think it's slower just because of the what she decided to do and the way she decided to do it. That's story structure, but I mean, like, it, yeah. as you were kind of pointing out, it, it's... She tried to make a stew. You know what? She had yeah, all right. these different yes. plot points, and sometimes you make stew, and everything comes together, and it's great. And sometimes you make stew, and it's just a bunch of different stuff in a pot, and it is not working. Another uh, a, a big part of this, and um, maybe Rich, you can enlighten us with a historical perspective on this. Is there? It's a lot of this is a class struggle versus modernization. And, and one of the things I noted is there's no I, what I uh, what I think is called pastoralism. So like like in Lord of the Rings, Tolkien was big on he was against industrialization and sort of getting back to the way things used to be. People like living rurally. That struggle is not it's not present in this story. It, it's, there's there's a right, modern, it's really not. There's you're, a modernization and it is causing problems for people. But the solution is not to be it's not contrasted with a rural society. There is no rural society in this that we that we see that that, that we speak of. You know, there's a big big division. You have people literally living underground like oh, is it Molochs or whatever and like HG Wells. That, or, can I say oh. that is honestly one of the things I really didn't like about the way that the story is told. The, the fact that there is a total lack of progression. It's like the story starts with this huge like upper tier society versus lower tier society. You got the, you got the no, bourgeoisie living above ground and yeah, the proletariats no, living underground. They don't tell you how it happened. She never no. tells you no. what the steps were to create it. My contention is that this novel has fully realized visions. Again, like you've got those scenes that you can You're see, right. right? But, and you can put it in your head, but nothing else is realized or even accomplished during the course of no, this book. No, it's, it's really nothing not. Nothing is. I mean, nothing even at is. the end, I think by the end of the book, Fred Eyre knows Maria's eye color. That's it. I mean, like, it, <laughs> by the end of it, the worker revolt has not succeeded. Uh, Rotwang did not get his revenge. I'm sorry. Am I ruining the book for people? Guess what? No, you know, yeah. this is... We, but I mean, uh, like, there's, we don't spoiler worry, alert. We don't was, worry about spoilers. Oh, okay, all right. Full, and, and, full discussion. Full okay, spoilers. but uh, you, you, you... Basically, there were, you, nothing was accomplished during the course of this book, and it left me completely unsatisfied because of it. And I don't, that's that was my ten cents on that. It's it really was disappointing. By the time I got to page a hundred, I started realizing that despite all of the the wonderful descriptions and despite all the wonderful symbology, none of it meant a thing because they basically it showed you that and it discarded it by the next scene and it moved on. Because she's covering so much. It, well, 
in, in idea-wise, in idea what? Wise. Was well, the book uh, 175 pages? Well, she's covering like so much with, with these subplots yeah. and these uh, these uh, these ideas, these symbols that she's got to throw in, and these con- these these conflicts that she doesn't get real deep All into. Right. So what you're saying is you want to blow this out in a full-on miniseries? I got gotcha. you. You no, want to flesh no, this I'm just, out? I'm no, pointing, I got it right. I'm pointing at the f- the failing. I'm pointing yeah, out yeah, the yeah. failing of it. The class struggle. I, I was uh, I watched a quick video today about you know analyzing this through a Marxist view and, and the person was even dissatisfied with it looking at it that way and, and and I don't know if this is you know this is this story is a product of its time and you have like she, she's wanting to hit on this class struggle she ultimately concludes that the you know that they that the workers that there's a there's a conflict between the proletariat and the bourgeoisie and the bourgeoisie is like the brain and the proletariat is the hands and they're always going to be in conflict until a mediator comes forth the heart and the heart will bring them together and that's Frederick. what i think is interesting what i think is really interesting about this story and i feel like a lot of people did not in the discussions that i heard in podcasts and videos did not get into is you get into this class warfare right the very interesting thing about this city is the workers are living underground and, and go with me here for a minute the workers are literally working underground, and it's it's almost like like Chicago has a deep deep tunnel system, pumping water out of there. These workers are working to feed a machine that pumps water out of the tunnels in city underground where they live, and the workers they're working to sustain their own like livelihood down there. They're also sort of working towards their own oppression because by living down there, they're sort of oppressed and they're not enjoying the full the full light of the city, like the people who live above, the, the privileged people, okay? The, the, and that was actually on, when go. Georgie escaped was, uh, that was one of the best parts of the book as well, is when he escaped, just his total failure to be where Freder wanted him to be because he suddenly he saw the light and he yeah. was like, holy shit, I have all this money, yeah. I have all this freedom, what do I do with it? I'm going to run in the, the, the brightest... Light. I'm going to run in the direction like a moth of the red. Flames, yeah. yeah. Here's yeah. And Although he, he doesn't burn red, out, he went straight to the red light district. Which, by the way, we've had no money. moths yet. So I just want you to know. There's no, no moth, moth. Even despite Rich's headlamp that he's wearing right now. That was one of the best, the best parts of the story, in my opinion, because that's exactly what someone would do. If yeah. you gave a working class person a million dollars, what would they do? In they his would pocket, go straight to the right red light district and just blow it all <laughs> on like strippers and coke. <laughs> Yeah, Frederick is like, okay, here, take all this money and my robes. And meet me later. And meet me later. And and and, I, and then uh, uh, the worker's like, yeah, uh-huh. yeah, sounds good. And then he just goes to the strip clubs. It was one of the best parts of the story to me. Like, I really, <laughs> I love that because it's so true. I mean, you just think, like, what would you do if you had $2 million suddenly to spend? You would go straight towards your vices. Like, that's, uh, it was like one of the only human aspects of this whole thing to me was... The way that Georgie just ran and just went and spent and went nuts. Like, I I love that because it was realistic and, and in a way that point, nothing what, else was. And what's the point of, well, so the so Frederick changes places with him to, to, be, to relate to workers. Right. And then he goes against his father and then he meets Maria. And this dude just has a ton of money that he took his, he took his place. And, right, right. And he just runs and does what. You right, know, but it's what he wants. Yeah, and it's it's not it's it's really no big consequence to the story because uh, that guy doesn't really come into play too much later. No, right? He, well, he, he no. comes back in later, but he does. Much later. But, but, but like, to, but to like what literally, consequence? I, I to wrote, what consequence? I, uh, he came. He in plays at, a part. Well, that's the consequence. Like didn't he, he plays uh, a part. He didn't take that's a it. bullet, but he did something equivalent during oh, the. Oh um, yeah, yeah, he took a knife. Oh yeah, what it was. Yes, so he feels bad, and he 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 defends Frederick. But it's interesting that Frederer is the savior of the of the workers. Frederer, who is sort of like a noble, and he and he has to come down from the high society and be the one who's going to be the mediator. Which it, I I don't buy. Yeah. Pardon me. It, it, yeah. Again, well, that was the generic hero story. In it, a it, way was, that, it was set up that it was way, the and I don't believe it for a minute. By the time that book ended, you know what? Maybe I was so fatigued that I just didn't really pick up on it. <laughs> Even though it's not a long book. It's not, but it it, <laughs> it really, is fatiguing. It just reads long. It, but here's but here's the thing. What's the what's the movie with uh, Rosebud? What's that movie? Um, Citizen Kane. Citizen Kane. Okay, yeah, that one. I, this story, it's kind of up there with Metropolis, actually. Yeah, you know, this story. They're talking about good movies. This then. story reminds me of that because the oppression of the workers is sort of focused on Joe Frederson, Frederick's father, who's the who's the one running the whole city, the brain pan of, at the brain pan of the city. He is the brain of the city. 
he's like an obsessive guy. Okay, he, he, he he's not really about vices. He, he Joe Frederson is not really even enjoying the the big city life. No, he's all about he's power. But he's not even a big about power. He's he's about feeding his own obsession of just running the city. It's just Actually, power. What, it's it's pure one power. Comment, one comment when he said when he fired Josephat was that Josephat's his crime, secretary, his yeah. secretary was that Josephat did not enjoy the work. Anyway, just yeah. something to so, keep yeah, in mind. So, so, that's so, what I think Hitler probably liked about it. Is was that moment? I, I don't know. That's just my opinion. Like, are you kidding me? I, oh, no, yeah, like Josephat. The, the whole we know, Josephat we know thing, Hitler like, liked the movie. We don't know that he liked the book. Anyway. Good point. <laughs> <laughs> I just I don't know why. It just it, it occurred to me that I mean Josephat was uh, who befriends Frederer. He was the comparison with the machine and. and Frederer, uh, well, yeah, Joe Frederer compares him to his weakness to the machine. Like, why do you love these machines? His son asked him, and he said, well, because I can see the comparison with the human and therefore identify the weakness of the human, and that was Josephette. Josephette or, 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 or Joe Frederer says that? He, Well, Frederer says that about Josephette. He says that I... You know, I appreciate the machines because they show me the weakness that Joseph no, had. No, Joseph, you're confusing Joseph Ed and Joe Frederer. No, Joseph Ed is the, his first assistant, right? Oh yeah, that he yeah, fires. Yeah, yeah. The, re- the reason why he fires him and, and his description oh. of firing him is that Joe he, Frederer's description of firing and 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 his son Joseph asks him Ed. like, "Why do you love these machines so much?" And he says, "Well, I love the machines because they show me the weakness and the difference between the humans and you know the ultimate intelligence that the machines possess." I think that Joe Frederson is like a workaholic, and he's obsessive. There's a lot of obsessive personalities in this story. I think that's that what Hitler that. identified with when he saw that story. I, I really do. What I noted is that Joe Frederson, the way he gets conquered is that his son, the main character, Frederer, leaves him for the workers. And that is the only thing that he cares about more than the machine. And when he suddenly doesn't have control over his son... He bends his will. It's almost like Citizen Kane when uh, there's the moment yeah, with, with, sends, with uh, Rosebud, the, the to sled. watch his son. Yeah. yeah, he's obsessed with his son, and he, when he finally realizes he can't control his son, that's when he he has his failing, his his uh, he, he flails, and he he decides to give in. He becomes human, and it's because c- to me, this story is actually more about like familiar relationships and the way that to, to, to defeat the machine and the classism is not the the workers and all that it's almost like familial relationships and having that kind of bond and the people who don't have familial relationships like like uh groat who's the the guy who runs the machine he has a relationship with a machine that's false there's the robot that is turned into to look like maria the savior of the workers or the prophet the prophetess of the workers and she tricks the people and they refer, refer to Maria as a mother. There's a lot of like re- f- familiar relationships oh, mentioned. Yeah. And There's and father, of course she son, was named Maria. You know, she, yeah, Maria like she, mother. Yeah, again, right. Just, just again going Christian on the mythology. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. So I feel and like. And by the way, the, in case anyone is curious, Maria is a virgin. Maria is a virgin. And pardon me, we're talking about Maria the person, not Maria the robot. We don't know about the robot. The water knows. The water Let me knows. tell you. The robot might is, have been from the red light district. It is definitely. She is definitely a virgin. It is very well covered in the book. Virgin. Yeah. So, I think what it comes down to is is that Joe Frederson ends up becoming he's sort of like a machine running a machine in when he runs this metropolis, but he realizes humanity when he loses his son, which is a natural thing, and that's the element of the natural world is this familial bond, and that's what breaks apart the oppression and the class struggle yeah. is actual natural familial bonds. You're right. Yeah, it's... Uh, and and um, a lot of the discussions I heard about this story, that's not really mentioned. Well, I, I agree with your last sentence. You kind of took a while to get there. I was going to argue with you during your, your justification. Good like, thing before, I kept talking. Thank you for coming to the thesis, because <laughs> I, I do agree with you on that, because I was about ready to say, well, then what, the, what about his mother? The mother that he loves so much that does not like him that he transplanted... Joe, Joe Frederson's mother. Joe Frederson's mother. Frederson's grandma. Yeah. Because the, the, uh, Hell is the mother of Joe, and she's yeah, deceased. And, and if she has a name, I don't know what it is. But, you know, he, she's got it... it uh, he's got a mother. I just call her Ma Frederson. Yeah. You know, she's ornery. Grandma. <laughs> she's ornery. She's paralyzed. She's imprisoned, and she's disappointed. She's disappointed in her and, son. But she loves her grandson. And she wouldn't, she wouldn't uh, you know, this goes back to uh, uh, both of you brought up pastoralization. She lived on a farm. She did not want to leave it. Is it. No, I have a question for you. 
Is isn't her house like a farmhouse in the middle of Metropolis? Yes, they transplanted it. Yes, that was so, so interesting. So they literally took her farmhouse from the countryside, the soil, and I believe it was a walnut tree. If yes, anyone wants to argue, I with think me. you're right. And they basically put it on top of a building in Metropolis, <laughs> and apparently the tree didn't like it for a year, but then it came back and it did fine. And, and she's the, not happy about it. For the gardeners in us, we worry about that very much. So I was very concerned, but the tree came back. It was all good. <laughs> but, like, so there's this there's this garden, rooftop garden in the middle of Metropolis that houses his mother, which, you know, I guess... Joe Frederson's mother. Joe Frederson's mother. And uh, it, it was a, a couple of scenes that they ended up there where basically he's looking for... When you talk about familiar relations... He runs home to mama. He asks, what, yeah. what, "What do you do? What do you do about my boy? And what you know? What about this?" And, and she's not too sympathetic with her son. She's nope. more sympathetic with her grandson, Frederick. Yeah, she she actually has not gotten over the transplant as well as the walnut tree. So I mean, yeah. uh, the walnut tree is happier to be there. But uh, it also reminded me of almost like you know how every movie in New York. Okay, not every movie, but. Movies in New York always have that one rooftop garden where, like, there's always a wedding on there, Spider-Man lands on there, there's a lawn, there's trees, all that stuff, but it's, like, up above. It always, it, it makes me think of that, like, there's just this this one area on there and, and goes in there, but anyway. It, 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 that is the element of pastoralism, is, is, is Grandma's last holdout right. but he brings in, the, it in the middle of the city. And he brings it into the city. And the other part you brought yeah. up with pastoralism, and I know we're going back, like, ten minutes. That's okay. But was when Josephette jumped out of the airplane. He did have a parachute, people. And uh, when he got to the bottom, there was a country girl there who's working a farm. And he's like, well, where's a railroad? There are no railroads. Where's this? And basically, I think he hung out with the country girl for a week, uh, rolling in the hay. But eventually he makes it back to the city, so he must have been walking. But uh, she didn't know that there was a city. Oh, yeah, that's right. That so is that, right. That really yeah. confused me, too, because I'm just sitting there going, what? What? You don't even... There's this huge metropolis, and you don't know that you're feeding it, presumably, oh, with your food. I have something food. to say about that. Yeah. I got something to say about that. Oh, damn it. <laughs> so that, that is an element of pastoralism, I guess, is Joseph Atz. Uh, oh, it's not a good one. But it, I mean, like, th- his but that's wild like another, ride out to the... But it's you know another I, piece that's I loved in there. about that. I, I loved that. The fact that they met someone who didn't know what metropolis was. Yeah, because metropolis was feels like huge. The, it feels huge. The sole, yeah. like, moment of hope that I felt like reading that whole oppressive tale was the fact that they went far enough that they found somebody who didn't know what the hell Metropolis was. Because you, know? you didn't want to know what it was anymore. It wasn't so much that. It was just the, the concept that, that point, here's might this have. massive like saga of class oppression going on in this centralized space, and they went a little ways away, and here's a person who has no clue like what any of it is. Like It, it yeah. just... That was. It was almost like I wanted to hear the story of that person. I wanted to know that person's reality. It, it puts it in perspective. It really yes. does. And and the inclusions of of those types of things are what makes this book, in my opinion, like actually good. Which I don't. know, It's kind of weird, but just to know that the world exists outside of Metropolis and all these things that are happening, you know, the, there's this depth. It just adds depth. Really? Okay. So there's one weird sentence in the book that, that, that addresses this, and I'd like to, to bring it up. But there's, I, I suppose I want to bring up two things. One, the author specifically decided to name this thing Metropolis. She didn't name it Berlin. She didn't name it Paris. Mm-hmm. She didn't name it anything. Mm-hmm. So it's a fictional city. And there is mention of New York and certain cities in it, yeah. There, but there, Actually, I only, re- I only really recall New York... And I think where they were trying to send Jehoshaphat, like they were, they were, is it or Joseph, whatever his name is, they were like trying to send him like the Italian coast to vacation forever or something like that, wasn't it? I mean, like that's like the only real places. Y- but, Yoshiara, uh, Yoshiara, Yoshiwa. Well, that was like a drug den. I Yoshiwara think. was a neighborhood. It was like a bar. Yeah, but it was it's a real place in Tokyo. That I didn't know, and thank you for telling me. Yeah, it was a red light district, and um, that makes more sense to me now. But literally, she chose that for a reason. So it's one of those things where. It also just makes me sit there and go, where the devil is this place? I mean, like, literally, where the devil is it? But then the other part of it gets to be, somewhere in the, in the uh, and I've got it underlined in the book, they mention that there's no other city like it in the five continents. <laughs> if you guys can count your continents, we're always taught in school there are seven continents. They got rid of Antarctica, first of all. Well, fine, that brings you down to six. Now, if you don't count Australia, that could bring you down to five. But I, I don't know what's taught in the schools there. 
the question gets to be, is this a fictional world and we really shouldn't worry about it? And or maybe, you know maybe it's historical. I mean, back in the 20s, who knows what the continents were. Hey, guys, were you know, right now somehow we're down to eight planets, despite what I learned in school. <laughs> and, oh, wait, we might be back to nine because, I don't know, did they find Yugath beyond Pluto? I don't know. <laughs> Yugath was that H.P. Lovecraft? Yes, thank you. I'm glad somebody got that. That's <laughs> a anyway. great, yeah, great reference. The, right. um, she nice starts the book off with a quote. It's an, I don't know if you call this an epigram or something. It, it says... This book is not of today or of the future. It tells of no place. It serves no cause, party, or class. It has a moral which grows on the pillar of understanding. Quote, the mediator between brain and muscle must be the heart. End quote. That's what she starts the book off with. So she doesn't set, I think, a specific time or place. She tries to say this is its own thing. True enough. Which I think is kind of related to what you're saying. Yes, that's a cop-out. No, no, it's not. But I, I mean, like, I don't, I don't but, think so. but you start, you start sitting there, and you're like, okay. So now all of a sudden, it, sometimes it, a little detail can hook you. And the five continent one got me, and it was just one of those ones where I was just going, should I be thinking of this in the real world, or should I just be thinking of this as the world and go from there? Because you know, it's like, okay, so wait, after the last war, did Frederick yeah, walk? I, I out guess and, you're right. It sets a some, reference point. Is did what someone it does. walk into this field and decide to start building a city, or did he take it over? You know, it's your point earlier. You're like. We don't know anything before or after, and that really is annoying because it gives you no frame of reference. It, 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 you know, going along. I with feel like said. this is this story is almost like a fable. Okay, now that's a fair idea, except for the fact that it gets nowhere and teaches me nothing. That it, yeah, well, that actually think, is an interesting idea. I mean, whether I or not you learn what she wanted. Oh, how dare you! It, I mean, she wants you know she she wants you to to. I actually have five things the that I learned from this book, but you know. Oh, you can, well, then, what are they? Oh no, no, we can wait till the end. You can summarize. <laughs> no, no, let's 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 hear your five things that you learned. No, the five things that I learned from this book. Oh, no problem. Give me a second here. Actually, I'm down to four because one of them apparently should go on the movie podcast. Oh, okay. But uh, let's see. Well, actually, we haven't brought up we haven't brought up the Me Too references yet, so I, I really would like to talk about that before we get there. But, uh, wow. you know, uh, pardon I have me. no idea what where that's going. Well, if you want to talk about? I it, don't get the reference there. Would you like to talk about the writing style? I guess, I guess where I was at is uh, th- that comes a little, a little bit later. Is uh, uh, maybe with the water and the you flood? You want to talk about the writing style the itself? Wa- yeah. yeah. What, what do you mean? Go well, ahead, go ahead. The writing style itself, we all had difficulty with. Yeah, now, right. we don't know whether it was the translation or such. Right. Towards the end of the book, let's just say kind of the climax, uh-huh. there is a great flood scene. Now, Yeah, Noah. Right. Another, except, uh, another... except for the fact that this flood is from the bottom up. And, True. And, you know, I always found it fascinating that basically they built this great city above ground, but they spent more time building this great city below ground. It takes more work to build something below ground than it does above ground. Mm-hmm. And that really just sits, it bothers me because I'm just sitting there going, well, why would you waste all that work on the workers? Why wouldn't you just send them further out and make faster transports? But ignoring that, mm-hmm. um, the flood scene in the middle of it, while they're, while they're doing it, all of a sudden it switches narrative style and it starts talking from the water's perspective. Mm-hmm. And the water... I feel like the story got faster at the end. It did get faster, but literally the water starts talking. So, it, it, and it really bothered me, the switch in, in narrative style. So it went to an anthropomorph... It anthropomorphized the flood. Mm-hmm. And... Yeah, you know what? I think she did... Did she do some, like, head hopping in this? Like, I, in the sense that I think that she didn't just stick with one limited perspective. It might have hmm. been more of an omniscient perspective. It's another layer. It was generally omniscient, I thought. Yeah, but, I think she jumps around. But in this around. case, she jumped into the flood. Yeah, and, and the flood, okay. the flood really creeped me out because... Okay, so this was written by a woman, okay? The book was written by a woman. Mm-hmm. She's on her second husband. We know that she was, shall we say, uh, active. And such, you know. And let's not pretend she was virginal and terrified, all right? This is her second marriage. We know she's not a virgin. Yeah. And I, I guess what I'm saying is, instead of the water lusting for Maria, it was lusting to get up to her hips. No one else has held them. I'm lusting to get to oh, your yeah. breast. You know, shouldn't the water be hungry or something? I, I, not I, this water. No, apparently not. <laughs> and, and I mean, like, it, it should be looking to consumer, not make more baby water. And it just really was, it, it really bothered me in that way. That that one scene Maybe really Maybe that's did. just one of the feminist aspects of the book that, as men, we couldn't possibly understand. 
Sure. <laughs> well, water I, but, water is associated. It was with, a. Pre- I mean, it was associated with probably, drowning in a way. Well, she's I mean, probably associating water with like creationist myths, or maybe and, no, and that's what it, she's it wasn't building even on. Creationist myths. It's like what, well, that's what I mean. It's the, more the, oppressive. It's like I'm touching your ankles. I'm coming up to your hips that no man has experienced. I'm yeah. You yeah, know, thank you. I, I might be reaching your breath. Like, like, it's like a creepy rapist water, and it I'm is like, wait, aren't you trying to? Eat, aren't you trying to kill them? What? What do you? Re- I anyway, it bothers. And the me. workers, like they contribute to the release of the water, which is their own demise. Oh yeah, no, no, no. I'm bringing it back to the real kind of plot. Just bringing we, it back to the real. There dude. was no way that we actually knew that was going to happen until they destroyed the thing, and someone goes, "And by doing this, you are now going to be flooding the." Under city and your children are going to die, and until yeah. they yeah, literally it's, it's sat weird. there, and I don't know what it. that water represents. It was. Uh, I think she's just. It's just like another, yet narrative. another mythology she's bringing in. She's bringing in a flood, because she's got to bring in everything in, uh, in 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 mythologies in and not just a Christian mythology. I mean Gilgamesh and stuff. There was a flood. She's trying to bring it all in. It's true, and and he's absolutely right. The the flood is almost universal, uh, not quite universal, but it, it is. Held by multi religions, anyway. Yeah. We, we've seen that it has a basis in multiple things. Whether you boy, uh, she's throwing it, in everything, like you said, like a stew, like she's throwing everything but the she's, kitchen sink. She's throwing in it all, yeah. and and I'm just saying that it, it 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 started conflicting with each other, and by the end of this thing, you have two. You've got two lovers who don't know their eye colors. You've got revenge that is that's why i said revenge is the storyline because that is the most clear storyline that uh, when when it finally came across could be traced across because it's not a worker revolt it's not a oh i created a robot and now it's revolting against me no you told it to do this it's not a uh, it's not a lot of things i it, it the story it really, is more about love <laughs> conquering all I think the story is a bunch of visions until it gets to the end. It just ended. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it sometimes sometimes things just kind of churn to the end, and, and that's it. You know, it'll probably yeah. be like this podcast. You know, but, but uh, you know. It, <laughs> well, I think she just—it's almost like she just keeps throwing mythology and more mythology at us, and and then all of a sudden she wraps it all up. Yeah. And says, Fair "Love, enough. love is the answer." <laughs> well, yeah. And you know, love, lo- love is all. great. Don't get me wrong. Love conquers all. Well, what, what, what were the other things you learned? You said there was oh, five. I, oh, I'm sorry. Well, if we're going to do my five things that I learned from this. I, Rich's top five. Come on, this is a new well, uh, pardon me. I, I actually have, feature of the podcast. Well, I've got five, but uh, one of them I was going to was gonna say is uh, it belongs to the movies. Okay, so. well, not that one then. So I'll do the four. But yeah, basically, every time you go in the pool, the pool thinks it's going to get some from every fine woman that takes a dip. Oh, you're going back to the pool. All right, I'm besides the water, the besides the okay. anthropomorphic water. Uh, worker revolts make a great red herring. The worker revolt <laughs> was was a distraction. It was window dressing, you know, for I, the revenge and the love story. Yeah, well, look, that it, was like the whole story, though. But, but I, I, it, it I, didn't I, resolve I, itself. They didn't say yeah. what they wanted. Nobody, there was no goal. No, there wasn't. And I mean, like, it, it, and the workers I, end up screwing themselves by destroying the pumps. I mean, let's let's be let's be honest. One of the they silliest put their own things, children in danger. One of the silliest things, and Ryan and I kind of we're touching on this this afternoon. There's a ten hour clock. I mean, that means your start yeah. time is changing, like, every four days, whether it's daylight or nighttime. I mean, like, you can't get any kind of consistency whatsoever with that. It is nuts to say that it's ten hours. And right above it, okay, so now I'm kind of referencing the well, movie. Well, the eight-hour workday is a modern invention. Maybe it didn't exist back then. Okay, but But let's, their clock was ten hours. Let's go back to Royal Navy then, okay? Royal Navy... You would have either three eight-hour watches or four six-hour watches, or you would even make it the four-hour watches. I mean, like, you, you would split it up, and, like, no one would get a good night's sleep. But there's your most systematic organization of your working hours. You, you basically either had to go with daylight or you had to go with splitting everyone up. So it, it all depends how you want to do it. But ten hours makes no sense, like, as a, as a point. If you're going with a 24-hour day, which by reference in the clock in the movie... They knew was there because there was a 24-hour mm-hmm. clock above the 10-hour clock. Oh, there was? Oh, I didn't notice that. Yeah. Anyway, and I know, again, right. that belongs to the movie podcast. But All right. anyway. Yeah, are we talking about the movie yet? Not yet. No. <laughs> My point number three, th- three things I've learned is that how do we solve a problem like Maria? The song works well in all Austro-German uh, literature. You can just go along with that one. It, uh, Maria is a problem in whatever film she's in. No, <laughs> no one knows Sound of Music? Come on. 
Maria is a. What do you mean? By that Maria's was the 30s. How do we solve the problem? Later. Like Maria, your sisters were in it. You dragged me to to watch the musical with you. Don't give me that junk, O'Reilly. <laughs> I went with you to suffer through to that. To see my sisters in the in Sound of Music? Yes. Oh, okay. Fair enough. All right. And now you're on my and now podcast. We're on te- and now we're on tender moments in All these Bacon years O'Reilly later. friendship. <laughs> and, of course, every megalomaniac control freak is a mama's boy. And probably yes, wants a 10-hour yes. work day on top of it. Yeah. Every megalomaniac is a mama's boy. Yeah, he goes to his mom at he the end. He goes to his mama at the, in the middle and at the end. Anytime he's got a problem. Right when it's bad. He goes to mama. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying. Well, that goes back to the familiar relationships, I think, that run, it does. It run does. in this story, which I think is more of a... It's more developed than the, the class struggle. But, all right, so we're talking, we're talking about familiar relationships. He keeps on referring to his, his Frederick, not Frederson. Uh-huh. Frederick as not a man. However, he does not seem to be bringing him along in his career. You know, he's just letting him hang out at the club all day. and uh, Yeah, he doesn't and, and do such. any training. So, I mean, like, well, I think Joe Frederson is not ready to give up control anytime soon. I'm just saying. Yeah. You know, and, and so it's, it's not there. And, you know, also, one of the most artificial things, uh, you're talking about familiar relationships. Mm-hmm. I'd like to talk about relationship relationships, friendship relationships. Mm-hmm. The friendship relationships, or even the... I don't know. Borderline sexual relationships are the most phony thing in this book. Josephat and Frader are friends because Josephat has nothing else in his life because he just got fired. Yeah. You are going to be my friend and my <laughs> no, follower. No, it's sympathy. It's it's the initial act of the heart. He sees uh, the firing and he he acts and yeah. he tries to help. And but we don't meet the, anyone else to say who Frader's friends are. It's just Josephat and the worker. Well, Josephat, he, he, he has trouble yeah. trusting them. There's, there's not a single other person. Is what well, I'm no, he to say. specifically yeah. states that he does not have any friends. Yeah, because yeah. the way that he was brought up, the elite nature of his childhood, he has butlers, he has yeah. waiting staff, but he has no friends well, to rely on. That's the breakdown of the society, right? There is no real relationships, or or that's what they're trying to to work towards is real relationships. He has no direction to run, and and he even says that in the book. He and says, his relationship with his I father no is friends. artificial. I have no one that I can count on. I have no one I can go to. Yeah. So Josephat, will you be my friend? He says yeah. that specifically in the book. Because well, he has nothing. True, but he also picked a person is, who had nowhere else nothing. to go. Yeah, but, th- but maybe, he, had well, a per- yeah. he had a person who had no other option. But maybe that's what this like. I, I keep I keep going back to that's what this story is about. It's about familiar relationships, which are not just blood relationships, but they're also just friendships. It shows you how they're struggling in this metropolis society to form any kind of real relationship with anyone else, whether it's a friendship or even a family relationship. It's always strained Actually, by the, to, to follow, to the follow, artifice of the society. To follow Brian's point, every adult did leave every child in the underworld to drown, so he might have a point there. Yeah, and, <laughs> and, and I have to think on that. Yeah, they're, they're all about <laughs> destroying the point. They're all about destroying the machine until oh wait, our children are down there. Oh wait, our children are all dying? What? I, yeah. I, oh, hang I on. Forgot about them. They're under they're under sh- So th- so this story is more about like technology versus f- familial relationships and and, and, and friendships. It's about technology versus, like, human-to-human relationship. I still think it's a lot of stuff all thrown together. Well, I think the other stuff is almost, like, heaped on top of that. It is a hodgepodge. As I, with the window dressing. I guess what I'm saying is, I, if she had picked one real... Pardon me, if there had been a real focus for the novel... I think that that is the focus, but it's it just buried. Better. It's just buried on, on, by all of the mythology that she's trying to... She's almost citing all these other myths as, like, authority for her and that's, authorship. And that's why I've contended... Uh, pardon me. What I dug out of the narrative is sticking with revenge, because I just... It, it, yeah. I, I can follow revenge. <laughs> and it was easier. Because well, it's, it's more the straightforward. Love, the, lo- the love story was literally two people seeing each other twice and instantly falling yeah, in love. Otherwise, there's no point. There's the control freak father mm-hmm. who, when he sees something he no longer has controls of, freaks out. Yeah. And okay, uh, yeah, and and that and and Rotwing is Rotwing, also c- Rotwing c- c- was the most interesting thing because he lived in that house. <laughs> and, but and he's also interesting because he his wife is stolen from him. Well, it's 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 they were both courting the same woman. I don't know if it was his actual wife at that point. Yeah. Well, I mean, like they're he, both. Uh, going but he's the defined same by it. I mean, he, that's true. Okay, he, yeah. he, he it's he's still obsessed with the fact that he lost her to to Joe Frederson. 
and yet he still works for Joe Federson. Are you kidding me? His ghost house probably kept teasing him about it. <laughs> well, and, and, or how do we know the ghost house didn't let her out? Rod Wing is a very interesting character because it's like he lost hell to Joe Frederson, but yet he still will work for Joe Frederson, and yet he he goes and lives this weird existence well, in this house. Well, and he used like, that he's like, robot to destroy everything. Right. He, he right. used he used that. He used a non-familiar like relationship. He he created an artifice sort of born of Metropolis to cause more havoc. Yeah, to undermine and, everything that was happening yeah, in society. Yeah, and to mimic used it to create chaos in the working class and by used mimicking it to familiar relationships. Lost in the you know the superior class. Not just lust, but like he uses the robot to trick the workers by becoming their mother figure. Who Maria is their mother figure. So he uses the robot to mimic it. That shows you the whole artifice of Metropolis. I mean, I, I, I don't know. I feel like that's what this story is about. It's about the fact that this modern society is artifice. But this, but and unlike Tolkien, it's not like we need to be more pastoral to defeat this. It's no, we have to more get more in touch with each other as society, as people. And I feel like that's where she's going. You know, you might be right. That's what I saw, and I, I didn't see a lot of other podcasts talking about that. So it makes me feel special, but. You I, should feel. I, I mean, when she talks right. about the heart and stuff, I feel like the heart is the heart between human to human relationships, and she plays with that with the the robot. She plays with that with the me- mechanized society of Metropolis, and I think uh, Joe Frederson gets a heart in the end when he is, feels threatened by losing his son. Whether or not it's believable, whether or not it's successful, whether or not it's, it's buried by all these myths that she feels compelled to to cite and throw in there so there's like all these subplots and stuff what do you feel the symbology is about the robot hand <laughs> of the rotwing of rotwing so rotwing yeah well he's, rotwing, he's rotwing in, the, in the novel and yeah. by the way we need to separate this out because it's different in the movie uh, and i don't rotwing, know if it's different no this part's different in the, uh. in the novel versus the movie he said in the novel he said he forgot two things one that this one oil combined with this other thing makes uh, is doesn't agree with him that cost him his right arm and the other thing that he forgot was that Hell was a woman and Joe was a man. And in the movie, he says that the one thing he ever forgot was that Joe was a woman and Hell was a... You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, he, rever- he, he ignores the arm thing. So the arm thing was different. But basically, it kind of tosses out in the book, Oh, hey, by the way, I've got this robot arm. So it's kind of amazing that, one, this guy's got a robot arm. But then, two... It's also kind of like one of those things that that Beam talks about where we don't know the history of it. Did he learn how to build robots because he built himself a robot arm or or things like that? So basically, he he managed to turn himself into this, into half of the city where he's got machinery himself. And then you've got a person and you've got the person that is Rotwang with his robot arm strangling Joe Frederson's son on top of the thing and on top of the cathedral. So that's where I'm going with the symbolism is what do you see in that, if anything? Well, I think it goes on to what I was saying in that Rotwing is a flawed character. I, I mean, I feel like I have some sympathy for him because he's been jilted by hell and, and by... Uh, when you it, say flawed character, do you mean he's designed to have flaws or do you mean that... Or, or how do you mean that? Be, because he becomes part mechanized himself yeah. in the hand, he becomes less human and he has less ability to relate to people. He can't overcome his I'm not sure he's ever overcome any of his losses. Yeah. Anyway, but I'm just I'm just Yeah, and, and and he's flawed. He almost has and, the inability. He's becoming more robotic, more mechanized. He he is rejecting Metropolis, but he is Metropolis. Right? He is like more Metropolis than anyone else because he's part machine. Well, talking about the lackings. Uh, you know, pardon me. So if we're gonna, well, let's just say that that. Wait, hold you, on, hold on, Jim. That's please. enough. We got to save some for the movie episode. You're gonna use up all the wood already. I already did. Yeah, that's what I was worried about. <laughs> um, <laughs> Jim is like <laughs> insisting on feeding the machine here of fire. It's about to go out. The no, mo- hey, no more. Let it go. We gotta, we got a whole nother like hour to do. We got time. Start the movie then. <laughs> oh my god! All right, all right. Sorry, Rich. Uh, go ahead. I, I guess where I was at is is you have a person who is replacing the things that he's lost constantly with machine. You've got a person who's replaced his, I don't know if in the book it was a right or left arm, but an arm. you got a person who's replaced basically his lost love with a machine. Yeah. And that's why he and Joe are colleagues, because they basically, they basically 
do that with machines. Well, they're like, both obsessive more than anyone else. True, but they both they they are they are, are very still much talking ri- about this book. <laughs> they are very much rivals, and and in yeah. every way, shape, or form, and. And yet Rot- they're stuck. Rotwang, Rotwang finally found a weakness to Joe, but Joe never found really a weakness to to Rotwang, and in yeah. fact, he relied on Rotwang. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, he does. And, that, and, and, and again, he, that's 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 again, it's just one of that's those. That's what makes Rotwang interesting, is because he, he he's got nothing left to lose. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. But I mean, like as 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 we said, it's the most the most interesting parts of the book are Rotwang. That's why I'm just rooting yeah. for Rotwang. You know what? I, it, and but and he doesn't like he team Rotwang. He loses in the end, though, right? I guess. But I mean, like, who wins in the end? You get to the end of the book. We didn't. And <laughs> we, the reader did not win in the end. All right. No, I'm going to go with that. Thank you. Jim, You're welcome. The reader did not win in the end. No, g- we didn't. G- no, because you know why? The the worker revolt ended in well. J- uh, Joe says he's going to be nicer. Wait, what? Oh, wait, Joe's. Like machine perfection city has kind of been destroyed. Like the heart machine's dead. All these other machines are gone. So there's nothing good. Oh nothing wait, nothing good. The under- you're, you're right. There's nothing good. It's the like- un- the undercity is flooded. Yeah. So oh, are you gonna pump it out and con everyone to go back down? <laughs> all right, we cleared it out. Everyone get yeah, back. No, 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 it's my no, turn. Get back. You know, no, we don't get- win. There, it's like there's- at the end, there is no winner. There's just a bunch of chaos the and random. Win- yeah, the only winner layers maybe- of story. Hey, there are fireworks over there, like good fireworks. Oh yeah, you're right. About time something exciting happened oh, wow. on this podcast. How all dare right. you? Well, you know what? Let's let's leave things here with the book. All right. No. All right, I'm gonna let's talk more. No, we're we're gonna I'm gonna move on, and we're gonna give our final comments and our star ratings. Okay. Rich, we'll go to you first. How many stars do you give this book? And and and, and you any 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 uh, final comment? I know you've, you've kind of been giving your comments, but what's like your final comment and your star rating out of five stars? I'm giving this one and a half R2D whistles. No, I, I'm sorry, but you know what? Out of five, please don't sue us, George Lucas. It uh, seriously, this was a painful read. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry. I would not cross the street to get this book from you, Ryan. It it it, it was bad. If not I even did from not, me? if I did not know that I was going to do a podcast on it. I probably would have stopped at page one twenty. It felt like homework. It really. This was homework. It's not your turn yet, Jim. It no, felt like but, homework. I, but but we're on the same page. Okay. And it felt like homework. I'm sorry. I did not enjoy it. But that being said, this author does give you visions. I just don't think she does development. Again, nothing got anywhere. She she could go from scene to scene and give me the vision, and I wanted to see it in my head and so forth. But then. It never took me any place. And you know what? I didn't even want to get taken to the end of the book. And that's as far as it goes. I mean, it probably should be lower than that, except for the fact that some of the visions were interesting. And that's where I'm at. Okay. Jim, out of five, what do you give it? I'm going to give it... Uh, Rich gave it 1.5. No, what would you give it? Two? He 1. gave it 1.5. 1. 5. Oh, 1.5. That's lower than I would have expected from him. Uh, Go I on was, the Google Shared Docs, man. It was there. I was going to give it two... <laughs> Just because of historical importance. Are you still Obvious, going to? Yeah, obviously, as the you try, you like, struggled to finish this. Well, you, the horse, the right? historical concept, the hor- historical. What's what's the word I'm I'm thinking of here? Historical context. Context. Yes, I'm gonna. But you it, you struggled to finish this book, right? I mean, it was you, terrible. It was a terrible read. Uh, did you have to consult the cliff notes at some point? Was terrible. Uh, you n- couldn't find cliff notes on this book in German. Exactly my point. Yes, it's it's a horrible read, but the story was important and it helped us develop sort of the the baseline for. I mean, you could you could see 1984 in it. You could see some of the the directions that later authors took based mm-hmm. on it, and I think that the the significance of it is something that we'll never understand. Have you ever uh, read the Star Wars novel? Yeah, I have like the Admiral Thrawn novels. No, 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 like the actual Star no. Wars: A New Hope one. novelization. No. Okay, 
like like it, a tie-in novel. C three PO. No, no, like the George... took inspiration from it. I, I understand. No, like... no, no. What I'm trying to say is, it's a terrible novel. You know, the, the seminal ideas, even if you're trying to write things, doesn't mean that it's going to turn into a great movie or that it's a good, good something or other. Anyway, mm, uh, okay. it, it, you know, it, I I don't think because what resulted from it, it was good, means that you, you should give that, it a higher credit. You don't think that the historical nature of it should give it value if i made a movie from the constitution would you give it a good rating the constitution just because of uh, for reading i would give it two out of five <laughs> i don't know I mean, all right rich, enjoy- rich uh, you no, your, no you hold on i'm comments. not done i'm rich, not done yeah rich had his final comment i'm sorry. not done this, we're all <laughs> about- i'm not jim. finished jim go ahead sorry i think that it obviously was a very important story historically speaking i think that the style of writing was terrible it was impossible to read. I think that that might be just because we're, you know, 21st century men trying to understand something that was written almost 100 years ago and put a context on it. It's still, you still had problems, even with yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, it was it was not a book that I would ever recommend to a person to read. Mm-hmm. Okay. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm Agreed. Gonna, I'm going to give this three stars. Uh, I think I gave Jules Verne three stars. Um I, you I, are equating this book with Jules Verne. Well, when did Jules Verne write his books? Was it in the fifties or was it 1870s, earlier? Eighteen seventies. Oh, was it eighteen seventies? That was easier to read than like twenty thousand leagues under the sea. And in French, no, Jules Jules Verne is not necessarily easy to read. And there's a lot of lists in that, that book that I had to read, which also were a problem. Well, neither is a tale of two cities, but that doesn't mean it wasn't important. Well, I'm well, not. A tale of two cities is an easier read, I'm, actually. I'm, it I'm almost. Not, it's a horrible. Have you ever read that book? Oh my god, it's a nightmare. I read it in that January. Is, isn't that the hardest book to read? Like no, Moby historically Dick. speaking, Moby Dick. Is- I thought Tale of Two Cities had that award. Like this is the hardest thing you'll ever try to read, and oh, you will right. hate yourself after trying it. Anyways, wow. I'm gonna give this book three. I know who gives that out. Three stars. I think there's a there's a lot of aspiration in the writing, and incorporation of the myths. It it, it gets muddled. It gets slow. It's it, it's probably not a book I would I would not recommend this book to people to read. If the, you told me to read it, I made you read it. <laughs> There's a difference. So I'm sorry, you're taking a book that you would not recommend others read, and you're giving it three out of five. Well, I would not recommend people just to read it on its own. So I'm sorry. Hey, I, we, we, we talked but, about this earlier. In no, no, no. I'm just, I'm no, just no. saying, if you got a book that you're not recommending to read, I would think that might be two and a half. No, you know, at least well, that's midway. Because I don't think it's a bad book. Okay. Um, but I I didn't love it. And I, I would recommend it for people that are willing to put the time in and open themselves to it. So, but I would not just generally recommend okay, this book fair to enough. people, if you so know my, what I'm saying. That's fair enough. And and we're going to address this on the next yes, podcast. Yes, And And, and, and I, I think will, you had a good point about that. I would probably that, completely yeah. contradict myself. But my question for you gets to be, though, is, since I'm new to this podcast, what's the lowest rating you've ever given to a story on this podcast, and what was it? Oh, I can't remember, but I don't go too much below three. Okay. Just from perspective on me, right. yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't usually give too low. I, so you're uh, saying this probably, is the lowest you've ever no, reviewed? Well, but the, it's tied with a bunch of other stuff. Bram Stoker's The Layer of the White Worm. I don't remember what I gave that. Mm-hmm. If I gave that the same amount, I'd have to look. Okay, that is worse than this. Really? Because okay. it's it, that is uh, a lot more incoherent. Okay. Um, now, Bram Stoker was a playwright, and yeah, such, but he, so it, Layer of the White Worm had problems in the sense that I think he. Was oh, at, I'm completely unfamiliar. Yeah, so he wrote I'm that at the end of at the it. end of his life. I think it was more cobbled together uh, afterwards, and it, 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 it lacks coherence. And there's intre- there's interesting parts to it, but uh, that's another story. Hey, if you want to just be a Bram Stoker fan, read it. But if you don't, uh, you can skip that one. Fair enough. And I kind of almost have like a similar view on this one, but this one's more a lot more coherent. It just gets slow at point, but it, you know what? It's not a long book, so you can get through it. Okay. It, 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 even though it feels long, it's, it's not like a thousand pages. What is it, 215 pages? Yeah. You know, this it, one? It, yeah. Yeah, but you know what? As you, I earn said, like, you, you earn it. You, you earn, earn it. it. You earn <laughs> it. You earn it. You earn it. You earn the 215 pages. Okay, so that's enough um, about that. So I will invite anyone to visit our website. It's nodeodorant.com. You can like our podcast and subscribe it and write reviews on iTunes, our Apple podcast, Stitcher Radio. The podcast is also available on YouTube format if you want, uh, like to listen to your podcast there. Pretty much any outlet you can get podcasts, even Google Play, that you can find this podcast. 
We uh, hope you tune in later in the month when we're going to discuss the well-noted film Metropolis directed by the author's husband, Fritz Lang. So until then, all the way from the outer reaches of the Metropolis of Chicago, with fireworks in the background, although they're done now, and a fire crackling, we will say good night and farewell. Good night. The fire is crinkling. Good Good night. night. All right. For more information on the topics discussed in this episode, or to read our show notes and find us on social media, visit nodeodorant.com. For more information on Ryan Sean O'Reilly and his various works of fiction, visit ryanshawnoreilly.com. The theme music for this podcast was written by John Doyle from the band I Decline. You can visit him at i-decline.com. voiceover for this podcast was provided by me, Margaret O'Reilly. Well, that concludes our episode. We hope you've learned a lot. Again, thanks for listening to our show. And always, always remember, there is no deodorant in outer space. That's right. good. You're picking up the crickets? I didn't even know there were crickets. There's a frog out here. Oh. Rich, talk a little bit more. Well, I've looked this good since an early age. Uh, I know it's hard to believe, but uh, I've been getting compliments my entire life. So, I just learned to live with it as much as I can. Whoa, that time I got to be real. Beam, I- Beam, let me hear you talk. Uh, Rich has looked this good since an early age. Me and Dave were talking earlier today, and the consensus was when I saw him that all right, stop. He wouldn't Rich, let me hear you again. A bit. I no, I'm, the... I'm still talking. <laughs> oh, okay, I can hear you a lot better. You can hear Rich probably a lot better, right? Yeah, I can. Yeah, your mic was way too down. I was like messing up the knobs. That's what she said. So you need to you need to mess it with its knobs to get it to get it to perform. Is that what you're saying? That is what I'm saying. Hey, I'm just check. I should take off this headlamp now. This is gonna this is gonna go down. But no, I want to see the bugs. And you can really hear that motorcycle. Yeah, I think it gets the fire mic up. Kind of. Kind of fun. Hopefully, it's not getting singed. Oh yeah. I want to check and see. All right. Yeah. Maybe I'd better do this since it's not mine. <laughs> Dole appreciate that. Uh, she eventually. Dead air. Dead air. <laughs> I'll cut all the dead air out. Don't worry about that. Do you like to edit the good stuff out? Yeah.